Let me just say a couple words uh, about uh, uh, Cesar. Um, he has a, a very distinguished uh, uh, background. You, you've all read about Harvard College, Wharton Business School, a White House fellowship working with Colin Powell, which must have been interesting. And I hope you say a few words about that. Um, but I, I think I'd, I'd like to emphasize two other things uh, that are uh, really distinctive here. First of all, Cesar has uh, uh, reached a very senior level, a very influential level in a very important corporation at a shockingly young age. It usually doesn't happen like that. Um, so I think for, for those of you who are under the assumption that you know you can't really uh, attain a, a senior leadership role in a serious enterprise until you're much, much older, you're, here's living proof that that's uh, not the case at all. The second thing I want to mention is, and, and I think that, that uh, Univision's support of our program uh, is, is reflective of this, is, is the extent to which under Cesar's leadership, Univision has uh, embraced uh, or, or even stepped up uh, its prior embrace of a public mission uh, in a variety of contexts uh, uh, focusing uh, mostly on education uh, initiatives. And so I hope Cesar talks about that. Uh, without further ado, uh, Cesar Conde. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your lunch. Uh, I heard you guys had a very relaxed week. Uh, you guys are doing absolutely nothing, so uh, I'm sure you have a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, but no, all joking aside, congratulations, uh, first of all, to all of you for having been selected uh, for this program and for this inaugural class. Uh, I, I know that uh, Andy and all the, all the professors and Donna and, and everyone here is not only incredibly proud uh, of each of you, but is so excited to have have you all here and believe passionately in what we uh, we as a, as a, as a community are, are, are trying to do. Um, I also want to let you know I had the chance on the flight up here to uh, read through some of your through some of your bios, uh, and so incredibly impressive. Uh, and so I'm, I'm I'm very humbled, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to our conversation today because I, I definitely want to tap into some of your experiences as well. Um, I'd be remiss if I, if I got started without also thanking my friend Walter Rio and, and, and Tradicion really for, for incubating this, this important program. And so Walter, my, my kudos to you and, and kudos to Tradicion. Um, and we're proud to be partners with, with you all. Um, I want, what I wanted to do today was really, I'm told I have about an hour with you, and I wanted to spend uh, about 20 minutes or so, 30 minutes on the front end, and tell you a little bit um, about uh, about me that you don't sort of pick up from a, from a, a background or a bio or anything like that, and really then dive into a couple or a few better said lessons or observations that I sort of stumbled through life and sort of picked up along the way, and I thought I'd share them with you. Hopefully, they'll they'll be helpful helpful to you. But if you don't mind, I'm I'm going to walk around a little. Uh, and I think I think they gave me a little mic here. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Great. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit just about me to, to begin with. Um, I, as, as many of you, um, grew up here in the States, but my parents were immigrants. Um, I'm half uh, Cuban and half Peruvian. And so I think there's another Cuban mix here, right? A Cuban-Mexican uh, somewhere around here. Well, there you are. Uh, we bonded earlier. There's not many Cuban-Peruvians or, or, or Cuban anythings except in Miami or in big cities. And so, um, you know, my, my parents uh, immigrated to this country independently, and they came, I think, with the same expectation and hope that many of many of the folks in our community, which was they wanted to be able to provide uh, the the best opportunity so that me and my two younger brothers could maximize our academic uh, and our professional uh, our professional uh, potential. And I can tell you that we feel we, being my two younger brothers, and I feel very fortunate that our parents at a very early age instilled in us the value, and I think it was, it, it was inspired by their immigrant experience, the value that the only thing in the world that no one in the world can take away from you is an education. And you know, in life, you know, people can take your, your, your potential job, your potential money, or anything like that, the only thing that no one can ever touch is that education and those values that you were brought up with. And so very early on, they, they instilled that in us. And you know, I think that's something that, that drove me and my two younger brothers um, from a young age. And, and that's something that I believe at my core that the secret to success in this country, the secret to, and I always say this, to sustainable success, sustainable success, 
Because people can have success or fly by night and not be able to maintain it. But the, the ability to have sustainable, consistent success throughout your lives in this country uh, is through education. And so I'm so excited that you all obviously have found that, uh, that, that, uh, that value in yourselves and you're already striving for that on your own instinctively. And these type of programs are only gonna help you accelerate that, that growth. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about me growing up. I, I grew up in Miami, as some of, as some of you know. Uh, I went, uh, was in Miami until I graduated from high school. I went to a, a high school in Miami that was 99% Hispanic. 95% of that was, was Cuban. Uh, and so growing up, I did not have the concept of, of being a minority, per se. I was a majority, that's all I knew, right? Everyone was, was like me, everyone that had similar experiences uh, as me. And so that was, I thought, fantastic because at a very early age, I was very uh, sure, I was very clear as to who I was, who were my values, and where I came from. And I think that did and that has <coughs> served me so well in so many ways. But when I came to the college process, the college application process, one of the things that I struggled with was I really, really wanted to leave my hometown. I really wanted to break out of my, uh, the bubble, frankly, that, that I lived in in many ways. And so I remember I, you know, I decided to apply to many schools um, outside of, of Miami, and I ended up coming here to the Northeast and going to college. And you know, for me, it was an incredible experience. Couldn't have had, couldn't say better things about it, and, and had a lot, a lot of great lessons. But like many of us, I struggled a little bit with that transition that I think uh, occurred during that process. And you know, two very, two very brief ones that that I that I worked on when I when I got here. Um, the first was you know this transition of going from you know this concept of being a minority uh, was very foreign to me. Right? I you know I grew up in a place where. Cuba was the center of the world. And you know, I got to, to college and I was going to a relatively decent accredited institution. And you know, a lot of people had no idea what that experience was like for people that came from there or what my heritage was about. And so I remember that that I kind of struggled a little bit with that. And you know, that uh, that drove a little bit of my initial experience because you know, on the one hand, I had come here to experience and broaden my horizons, and I jumped into that. But at the same time, I had this sort of experience where I was almost going back to my roots even more so to overcompensate for that. And so you know, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that, that uh, transition, that dynamic. But that was an interesting thing that happened um, to me when I, when I got to college. And I'll tell you the other thing, which I'm, I'm, I'm very open about, and, and, and I'm impressed because I, I read your backgrounds. Many of you have very... Um, clear passions and objectives already, which I think is very early on in life, and I, and I commend you for it. But one of the, the things that I struggled with early on is I didn't really know career-wise what I, I wanted to do. I had some very strong beliefs, very strong uh, morals, but I didn't necessarily know how I was going to translate that into a mission in life, into a, a career per se. And so when I got to college, I think I started, I think, I started in, in pre-med, you know, and that you know, after taking my first pre-med class, I realized very quickly what a bell curve was, and I was on the wrong side of the bell curve. <laughs> um, and so out of pragmatism or, you know, necessity, you know, I said, you know what, that's not gonna happen. And then I sort of stumbled along and said, ah, you know, maybe I wanna be a lawyer. I didn't know what a lawyer was, but it sounded like, you know, something remotely respectable. And, you know, for one reason or another, I said, you know what, I'm probably not gonna do a good job there either. And fortunately, I, I stumbled into, into the world of business. And it took me, you know, a little while to sort of find my way there. But I decided that, you know what, I'm going to, I think I can put my, uh, the few skills I had back then, I think I can put those skills to best use in the business world. And so, you know, coming out of school, I, I went uh, to work in, in, in Wall Street in an investment bank. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, why, why did you do that? And so on and so forth. And, and I'll tell you, the, there was no master plan or no, you know, uh, rational reason for it. The, the real reason I decided to do a challenge like that coming out of college was because going through college, I was a liberal arts major. I had never really focused too much on, on the quantitative side or the, or the financial side of, of, uh, of my studies. And someone gave me the advice, which I thought was a really good piece of advice early on. And they said, you know what? When you're starting your career, one of the things that you want to do is you want to augment 
uh, all of your skills. You want to balance out the set of skills that you have. And I think a lot of us early on in our careers, and, I, and I'm making a point here because I think there's a key point in our careers where we have to transition on this thought process. But early on in our careers, sometimes people have the tendency to go only with what it is that they're good at. And I would argue, and I don't think I did this very well early on, but I got advice to do it early on enough in my career where it helped me. And that was to make sure that I was honest with myself about, about what were my strengths and what were my weaknesses, professionally, personally, and the like. And then go out early on and try to augment those weaknesses. So finance, quantitative stuff, that type of stuff was not my strength. So I jumped into the job that I could find, which was the most quantitative and the most financial that I could find. And so I did that for a couple of years, Pre pretty tough, some long hours, but you know you came out of that uh, a stronger person. And I ended up going to business school, and you know, truth be told, I still wasn't quite sure what it was that I was passionate about and what I really felt was my, was my calling from a, from a career perspective, per se. <coughs> And it was at school, it was at business school, so in graduate school that I first uh, became uh, intrigued, that I first became passionate about the media space. Um, I discovered, as, as, as many people in that time, discovered uh, the internet, uh, discovered what new media was like, and I discovered what media, no matter how you, how you define media, the impact that media had on people's lives. And I had never thought about that while I was growing up. Um, but as I got a little older, I started realizing media is really uh, a vehicle that plays such an important role in people's lives from the very get-go. And some of us don't realize it. You know, we're, we consume books, we consume uh, radio, TV, in this day and age, new media and the like. And a lot of our thoughts and a lot of our beliefs are formed by that. And so, I got intrigued with, with media at that point. And you know, I took a little bit of a calculated risk. Coming out of business school, I went to, to go work at a startup. This was a company, there was about five or eight people at it. And you know, there was people who said, why in the world are you doing that? You know, you've gone to these, you know, you've worked hard, you've got some degrees, um, why don't you go work at a big, safe type of job coming out of, coming out of the gate? Which, by the way, many people did and many people have been very successful. And that's what I did know coming out of college. But a, a little bit later in my career, I said, you know what? I want to do something that's going to be a little bit of a risk, something that is going to allow me to spread my wings and get some experience on the ground. And so I decided to take this calculated risk. Uh, it went well, but it also had its ups and downs through the, the internet uh, startup stage that many of you have probably read about. And you know, coming out of that experience, um, I was very fortunate that I was, uh, I had kept in touch with a lot of people who were, you know, my age, but also older than me. And I was recommended uh, by, a, by an older, older friend for this program that Andy alluded to, the White House Fellows Program. And for some of you that don't know this, I'm gonna do my 30 second commercial of the White House Fellows Program because I think it's honestly one of the best kept secrets um, in this country that shouldn't be a secret. And this is a program that's a nonpartisan program, a bipartisan program, it's run out of the White House. Uh, and every year, <coughs> the White House chooses 10 to 15 young professionals from all walks of life. Nonprofit, private sector, medicine, law, business, uh, whatever it may be, military. Uh, and they choose these young professionals, usually somewhere between the age of 25 and 35. And you go to, uh, to the nation's capital for one year and you serve as the special assistant to one of the cabinet secretaries. Uh, and so the, the spirit of the program is to make sure that we're nurturing, much like this, like this program, that we're nurturing uh, public service and future leaders. And so I had never in my life worked in government. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, but I got the chance for a year to work as one of the special assistants to then Secretary of State uh, General Powell, and I will tell you, coming out of that experience, similar in almost like a microcosm of what this program, this week has been to you all, coming out of that program, um, again, I had never done anything like that. I didn't have this incredible opportunity that I think you all have this week. You know, I, it really changed my perspective. It changed um, 
how I looked at what I could contribute uh, in my professional in my professional career. And so, coming out of the white uh, out of the fellowship, um, I wanted to go back in the private sector. I was trained in the private sector. I thought I could make a contribution there. And one of the things I was looking for was how in the world can I mesh, you know, sort of my passion for media and what, you know, I really felt was near and dear to my heart, and that was the Hispanic community and the issues that our community faces on so many fronts. And so as I was looking around for, for jobs and positions, I stumbled onto Univision. And Univision for me was, you know, it was an incredible company that had, that allowed me to sort of mesh those two passions for media and for and for the Hispanic community, and it's interesting. I I, I always tell people this, and it's a little controversial, but I, I fell in love with the concept of working at Univision, not because of what Univision was doing then, but because what I thought Univision could become, and what I thought the impact that Univision could uh, have on our community that had such unique needs, and so you know. That's why I joined, and uh, and I'm happy to share you know the different things that I that I did um, while I was in Univision. I've been there for about six and a half years, but you know the real the real thing I want I wanted to uh, to mention about that was that you know what when I got um, to Univision, you know we had run a very successful business for for many years way before me, and we were doing good things in, in our in our community. But one of the things that stuck out to me was what we didn't have a very clear and concise mission that all of us at the company could you know, wrap our, our heads around, wrap our arms around. And what we have put into effect at Univision in the last six or seven months is we've really reignited, reinforced our, our efforts, our spirit, our, our, um, our belief around the mission of, very simply, we are, Univision aims to inform, entertain, and empower the Latino community. Inform, entertain, and empower the Latino community. And the inform and entertain, you can sort of wrap your arms around, right? You can say, you know, inform, they do news, entertain, they have a lot of different programs across platform. But this empowerment one is a little bit controversial and a little bit sort of intangible to put your arms around, but it's really the one that I have um, felt the most passionate about and have put most of my energy around. Uh, over the last uh, over the last few months, and, and and it's rooted in the concept that our community has such unique and such special needs uh, across a variety of fronts that if we can get uh, a, a coalition of individuals, of employees, of companies, not just Univision but many other companies um, that care about this community, if we can put all of those uh, entities together to focus on trying to address important issues uh, that face our community, we can really fulfill the mission of what we all strive to do at the end of the day, right? Which is to have an impact, uh, a material impact beyond ourselves. And so, you know, I'm very proud of the things that, that we're doing. I'll, I'll tell you um, one example, and I think Andy alluded to it, is you know, education, as, as I started uh, in my initial comments, is, is near and dear to, to my heart and near and dear to so many people at, at, at Univision. And you know, what we decided to do a few months ago was we said, you know what, let's bring together all of the companies, all of the organizations that really care about this issue, not just Univision, but others. And we, we launched about, about four or five months ago this initiative called Es El Momento. Now is the time. And we, we partnered with, uh, we started with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, who are doing an incredible job on, on this and many other topics, and brought together organizations and companies such as Entrevision and, and so many other companies across the board. And we said, you know what, let's focus on a major issue uh, in our community, which is not only uh, the high school graduation rate, but more importantly, I think, I think I read in your bios, many of you share this passion, more importantly is ensuring that our, gener our young generation of Latinos realize that we have to raise the expectation of what we expect of ourselves. Uh, in this day and age, in the year 2010, it, it, it's not a, uh, an aspiration. It cannot be an aspiration to graduate from high school. It has to be a requirement. And I would go as far as to argue that graduating from a four-year uh, institution or a higher ed degree education 
is becoming a requirement as well so that we can compete, we as individuals, we as a community, uh, and frankly, we as a country can compete in an increasingly competitive global environment. And so when you, when you, when you read some of these st statistics in our uh, Hispanic communities, <coughs> it's staggering. And some of you may know these, but, but they're worth repeating because you all are on the other side of these statistics and you all are literally the creme de la creme and you need to know them so that you can make sure that you're pulling your friends, your colleagues, and that generation behind you up through the ranks. 50% of Hispanics in high school don't graduate this year. Don't graduate. Of the few that actually go on to college, only about 35 to 40% actually get through. And so when you, when you bundle that with the fact that today, approximately one in five uh, individuals in K, in K through 12, uh, uh, you know, under high school are Latino, and very soon that number is going to be one in four. So 25% of this country in high school is going to be Latino very soon. When you bundle those two data points, right, it, it, it creates a very, very um, concerning situation. And this is not, to be clear, this is just not a Hispanic issue. This is an American issue. This is an issue that affects our entire country. So. When you look at it from that perspective, uh, you know, this was an issue that we said, you know what, we as a community, we as organizations, if we put our heads together and our resources together, we can begin to maybe start having an itty bitty uh, impact on this. And so I give you that as an example of a, a topic and initiative that we have put into effect. Um, and that doesn't mean that we forget about our, our business. I mean, we're a for-profit company. And we, we have uh, owners, we have shareholders that we have to work hard on and make sure that we're successful. But that doesn't mean that we can't do it in conjunction uh, with, with the important um, issues of our time and make sure we bring them together. So that's one little example of, um, of some of the stuff we're doing and some of the stuff that I'm, that I'm, very, I'm very proud of that we, we've started to tackle. Um, you know, I'll, 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 before I open it up to some questions, I wanted to also share with you uh, a couple, maybe a few more than that, um, of, of examples of lessons I guess I, I, I came through, I, I picked up in life as I went through, through work and school and the like, and I sort of stumbled across some of these things, and so didn't really get it right the, the first time. Uh, but I thought they'd be, they may be helpful to you. And you know, I'll start with, um, with one that I think is sometimes intuitive to some people, but I'll be honest with you, it wasn't intuitive to me. And that first one was when I was uh, going through, I started going through through college, you know, someone pointed out to me the importance of extracurricular activities. And you know, I point, I tell people all the time, I point to a lot of the lessons that I learned in life and that I put to use even to this day, I learned them uh, in extracurricular activities uh, in, in college and in graduate school. And, and the reason I thought that, that that was so important is because, you know, I, I read this week when I saw your schedule and you know, that thing with different <coughs> colors and boxes jumped out. I, like, well, I don't understand the schedule, much less go through it. Um, so my hat's off to you all. Um, you know, I, I, I remember thinking, gosh, you know, today you guys uh, took lessons on negotiations and I know you spoke about public speaking and the like. And one of the things that I learned in, in, uh, in these extracurriculars was it was a great vehicle to be able to put some of those lessons that you're picking up in life, <coughs> put them into real world, real world practice uh, in an environment that uh, frankly is, is a pretty secure environment. And so I'll give you an example. You know, you guys are going to go on to be leaders, and you guys are going to go on to manage uh, people. You know, that's not an easy thing to do sometimes, and it's hard to get that experience uh, in early on in life. And so, in your particular cases, you know, going out and spending time and investing uh, your your free time in extracurricular activities, I believe, give, gives you the invaluable experience of being able to work and inspire your peers in the private sector. When you need to manage people, uh, or you need to inspire people, you know you have the the uh, the ability to incentivize them with 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 money, right? With with a reward. In in your particular cases, you don't. You have to inspire with ideas. You have to inspire with 
um, with authenticity. And so if you can learn how to do that uh, in early on in life, the rest of it is gonna be pr pretty simple for you. So that was one lesson I, I, I learned, and I wish I would've learned it a little bit earlier, but I learned it fortunately early enough, and it was the importance of, of, of extracurricular activities. Don't stretch yourself too thin. Don't, don't join 50 clubs. I would argue that your time is much better spent in picking that one, two, or three uh, passion area, that one, two, or three area of interest, and take a leadership position and, and do something special with it. Um, it. It certainly served me well, and I know many people that it's, it's served uh, extraordinarily well over the years. So that's the first one. Uh, let me take a look here, a couple I wanted to share with you. Um, you know, there's a second one that I, I alluded to a little bit, uh, but I think it's worth, it's worth mentioning. And that's uh, this concept of early on in life, and I would argue you all are, are very early on in life, that you should invest in, in uh, rounding out your skill sets. And I know I gave you the, uh, the, the Wall Street example on, on my particular case. But I think this is important for, for people to do, because again, sometimes too early in life, I would argue, uh, really promising folks gravitate only towards the things that they're good at and they don't complement or they don't uh, build up their skills in all areas, right? Now, in the same breath that I say that, I think it's also important that one is cognizant enough that at the right point in life, you realize, hey, you do have to make a decision and go with with a, with a focus, with a career, with a, with a choice in life. And so the lesson that I learned, and I think I didn't do it perfectly well, but I did it okay, and I've seen some people do it extraordinarily well and some people not do it well at all. And it was finding that right balance in your careers when you go from uh, <coughs> augmenting, from building all of your skills, building up your weaknesses, and when you get to the point in life where you say, you know what, I've done enough. I've gotten to 80 or 90% of what I need to do. Now I need to start picking and identifying my passion. What is it that really turns me on? What is it that I really want to do? And how do I maximize my ability to make an impact by, by focusing on my strengths, right? So I'll give you an example. You know, I, in my case, I felt I wanted to, to, do, to do business. And I, said, I gave you this example of, you know what, but I didn't know numbers that well. I said, well, that's not gonna work too well. Um, so I better take some time to understand these numbers. But I never was incredibly good at numbers, and I never was gonna be incredibly good at numbers. And so at some point, I realized, you know what, what, what I really enjoyed was dealing with people. What I really enjoyed was strategy and thinking about how you could grow companies, thinking about how you could help um, people and groups move forward. And so at some point, I started pivoting and saying, you know what, I've built enough of my, my background, now I'm gonna go into uh, positions that play to my strengths, that help me shine. And so it's a little bit of a complex uh, concept, but I, I like to share this with, with, with groups of leaders that are coming through, because sometimes they see people sort of push too much to the left or to the right of that process, and there's no right or wrong answer, but it's important that you give that some thoughts so you can maximize your, uh, your growth and your potential. Uh, the, the next uh, one I wanted to mention to you is, you know, and, and I think many of you have already started to find this, but you know, at the risk of stating the obvious, it's important that as you all go through your careers, you identify what it is uh, in your life that really turns you on. What's the passions uh, that you have? And so many times I, I see very promising, young, accomplished people who start pursuing uh, careers or ideas because they think that that's what can, you know, that's what people define as success and the like. And, you know, I, I argue very vehemently with people on this. I say, you know what, I think at the end of the day, what really generates um, success is people who find the things that are passionate to them. And the reason is, because I think as you go through life, um, if you are pursuing something that, that, you, uh, that you really believe in, you're gonna put your heart and soul into it. You're going to gravitate towards the things that you're good at. And at the end of the day, it's gonna put you in more positions of, it's gonna give you more opportunities to lead. And what do I mean by that? 
I'm a big believer that people follow um, authentic leadership. And, and, and what do I mean by that? People don't follow positions. People don't follow people in positions of authority. Um, no, no one really does that. You may have to do what someone tells you, but real leadership, I think, is when people can, can intangibly sense that someone is very authentic, is very passionate about what they're doing. And if you pick <coughs> your passion early on and you gravitate towards your strengths, by definition, I believe that you're gonna get in those positions where people are gonna be able to sense, wow, this person, he or she, really believes in what they're doing, and I'm gonna to want to be part of that, I'm gonna to wanna to participate in that. And so, again, it's, it's something that you, you, you have to give some thought to um, as, as you're developing, because I would argue that with, with that, um, you're gonna be able to really make more of an impact. So I'll close with, with two final things. Um, and I know you've heard this one here, but I, I just think it's so important, I, I have to mention it, it's, it's mentorship. Uh, mentorship, mentorship, mentorship. You all are incredibly fortunate, uh, not only because of the hard work you've done, but because of the opportunities that you've given. And I know this is a theme that you've heard this week, but please take it to heart. You, you all need to finish this program, and you need to go back to your schools, to your communities, to your families, and make sure that you're sharing some of this information, some of these lessons. Um, if you have younger siblings, I always argue you got to start with your younger siblings uh, and make sure that they are equally if not more successful than you. It's, it's hard work to be successful individually, but the truth is you dedicate yourself and you work hard, you're going to be successful. I think the really, really tough thing and the really admirable thing is to figure out the way where you're bringing up people behind you. And one of the things I'm the most proud of is, is, is of my two younger brothers. I would argue these two guys are better, more successful, and, are, and, are, and just are better human beings than I am. And the, the ability to be able to positively impact what other people younger than you or your peers are doing, I think is, is something that you may not realize right away, but is gonna have more of an impact on you uh, going forward than, than anything that you'll be able to do alone. So, um, I, I encourage you, I know other people have done it, but please, please take this seriously. I was joking with some of you when I was talking. Uh, you are gonna go back after this week and next year we're gonna have uh, same number or more people from your schools and other schools coming. It's a rhetorical question. Can you identify the person or two in your school that you believe can uh, benefit from this program, that you believe can contribute to this program? I would encourage you to reach out to him or her. I would encourage you to flag it for, for the uh, management team because that is gonna make you very complete, but it's also gonna really contribute to, uh, to the community around you and, and to the peers around you. So I'd ask you for that, uh, that fair as I'm sure everyone else has. And look, I'll, I'll close with a, just a personal anecdote um, and hopefully we can open it up to some questions afterwards. Uh, you know, I, um, as I mentioned, my parents, uh, you know, were very grateful for what they, what they sacrificed and worked and did for us. And they instilled in us very early on a very simple uh, sort of philosophy of life. And, and I'll share it with you. Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory. It was dream big, work hard, and stay humble. In that order, by the way. So dream big in that anything uh, is possible in this country with a good education, and you all already have that. Second was work hard. Unfortunately, you've learned it already, but for those of you that haven't, nothing, nothing worth achieving in life comes easily. And so you gotta put the blood, sweat, and tears into it. And the third is stay humble. Stay humble in that none of us, for whatever we may think, achieve anything without, without help, without support, without someone, someone giving us a break. And we need to recognize that and we need to make sure that, that we're cognizant to do that and someone needs to work to pay it back or pay it forward. Um, so anyways, with that, thank you so much for listening. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions or give any stories anyone, uh, or talk about any stories anyone may want to, so please.
Uh, well, thank you for your talk. It's very inspiring. Um, and what I'd like to say is, as you read our bios, you may have noticed that many of us come from disadvantaged communities, disadvantaged backgrounds. <coughs> Obviously, we have worked really hard and have overcome these obstacles. And what my idea is, our idea at the University of California, is that we want to go back and take what the skills and the values and the ethics that we learned in this program, communicate them back to the high school. In our area, which are disadvantaged, they have low funding, and many of their programs are being cut. Yeah. And we want to do this in a series of workshops over some weekends in Merced County and adjacent Stanislaus County. And I was just wondering if you could offer any advice or suggestions on how we may facilitate this for those of students so they can have opportunities such as we have. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, first of all, Kudos! It, it, it's, an, it's an incredible initiative, and, and I'm glad that you uh, that you all are doing it. You're all doing it together. Um, look, I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of thoughts from the experience I've had with with comparable or, or similar programs. Um, I, I think first, one of the most powerful things that you all are going to be able to offer is, and, and you're not going to necessarily see it because it's you yourselves. It's the it's the example. It's that uh, intangible member uh, mentorship that those students are going to be able to, uh, to see in you. So many times I think <coughs> many of the obstacles that, that, that people in general from disadvantaged backgrounds or people in our community, frankly, is just lack of role models. They don't even know what is, is possible. Um, we, uh, I, I worked with a, with a group of, uh, of people when I, when I was early on to, to, to start a, a similar type of mentorship program. And we were blown away every time we uh, we talked to students because you know they, they outside of you know one or two professions that they had been exposed to, they didn't know that you know they were uh, making it up or passionate about sports or they were passionate about music. Um, they didn't realize you could you know be a, uh, a a lawyer within a music company or you could be a sports agent um, if you weren't gifted in the area of sports. And so I think. Uh, just being role models, showing them that people from their backgrounds that look like them, that have the same challenges that they have, are able to achieve what you all have achieved, uh, is going to be an, an inspiration uh, in, in and of itself. And the only the second thing I'd mention is I think you you have to be very granular um, in, in, a, in giving tangible solutions to some of the challenges that they face. And so we all we all know that it's you know in many cases it's financial, uh, in some cases it's just lack of understanding of the, of the, for lack of a better word, the college application system. And so giving tangible solutions, um, either bring in an expert to actually talk about it. You know, the biggest challenge we had in our group was, you know, most kids would say, hey, I, I get it, I just can't pay for it. You know, so, you know, thank you for inspiring me, but, you know, help me pay for it. And, you know, we brought in, so we certainly weren't the experts in it, we brought in people who actually um, had real solutions for that. And we like to think that we're able to move the needle a little bit. Thank you. Thanks. Please, Pedro. Hi, oh, my name is Pedro Cervantes. I'm from the University of Houston. I was wondering what is the greatest lesson you learned about participating in the White House Fellows Program? Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. I, uh, I, mean, look, I, I could go on for hours. Um, it, it was a, it was an incredible experience. I, I was very fortunate in that I, I worked for someone that um, I, I went in having incredibly high expectations for. It. Very few times in life do you have high expectations for someone like that, and people actually supersede them. And so you know, I I, uh, I took that away. You know, I was and continue to, to try to work as one tangible example um, in, in communicating with people. And whether it's public speaking in large groups or small groups, or just trying to be able to connect people, because you know, good ideas are wonderful, but if you can't communicate that, explain it to people, and get people to, to corral around and collaborate, uh, they're just they're just nice ideas. And one of the things I learned the most from working with General Powell was his his incredible strength and ability to communicate uh, and connect with people. And you know, everything from when he would be in a small group of, of ten people. He, he, he had the ability to sort of, not only in a very concise manner, communicate what was the vision, uh, what the group had to get together to make sure that everyone was sort of working together, uh, but when it came to large groups, um, 
and you know, big speeches that he would give in front of a couple of thousand people. I remember I rode with him in the car to one of these one of these speeches, and you know, guy like you know, perfectly dressed, relaxed, joking around, walks up, delivers like an hour and ten minute talk, uh, no notes, you know, just talks off the cuff, charismatic, <coughs> and the like. And you know, I remember getting back in the car and just being like. Jesus, General, this is unbelievable. You're like the smartest guy ever. And <laughs> I wasn't trying to kiss up. I was actually being serious. And you know, and, and you know, he was super humble in that. You know, he sort of joked. He says, "Caesar, you know, you're, you're seeing me at the top of my game here, right? You know, I, I've been doing this now for 30 years." He goes, "I should show you some video or some, you know, uh, tape recordings of back when I was a, a lieutenant colonel in the army, and I couldn't put four sentences together." Right, and he just he just made the point to me that you know he just made a point you know that to be able to make an impact as as a leader um, you had to be an effective communicator, and he wasn't at an early age. And you know, by the way, when I say early age, you know, Lieutenant Colonel, he was probably in his late twenties, early thirties, and so he made a he made a conscious decision to methodically develop himself as as a communicator. And you know, twenty five years later best in the world but you know the lesson that taught me was you know some of these some of these great leaders uh, you know, some people are born but i think the lion's share of folks are are developed and, and are worked on so that's what i took away from that uh i'm jose ramon lara from yeah. texas a m international yeah. university and my question is well you actually talked about taking risks and stumbling onto certain things so i was just wondering do you are you do you foresee any risks that you're, you're going to be taking in the future, either in your career, in your life? Do I foresee any risk? Yeah. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I like that. Um, look, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in that, you know, yes, we have to take calculated risk, but as, as um, in my particular you know, case, you know, within an organization, uh, organizations, entities, but this goes the same for individuals, you can't stand still. You can't um, continue to do the same things over and over and expect that you know the world doesn't change around you and that you know things are just going to continue to turn out well. In other words, I think we all have to continuously challenge ourselves, continuously take ourselves out of our comfort zone so that so that we grow, so that we evolve. And it goes for individuals in that you know coming to this type of um, this type of, of, of event or this type of, of workshop. You know, it's exciting on one level, but at the same time, it kind of takes you out of your comfort zone, right? You know, you don't know a lot of people when you get there, except for maybe the few that you went to school with. You don't really know what to expect. You thought this was gonna be, you know, a few classes, you know, whatever, you hang out at night. You busted your butt for, for a week. Uh, and, you know, you probably were forced to do things that maybe in some cases you weren't comfortable. Maybe everyone here is comfortable negotiating or public speaking, but probably not all of you are. And so I think for an individual, that, that's important that we do. And I think the same goes for a company. You know, in our case, when you show them, we're, we're very fortunate, we've done very well, we have a great position. But if we don't continue to experiment and, again, take calculated risk and try new things, uh, we, we run the risk of being irrelevant, not tomorrow and not a year from now, but five or seven years from now. And in the media space, you know, and, and Walter can identify with this. I mean, I think if you would have asked us five or six years ago how people are consuming media today, um, you know, maybe we would have had a vague idea, but the, the speed at to which the, the change in the way people consume media today uh, in this country, how people consume media in our community, the Latino community, and how you all are changing the way you consume media, it, it was unimaginable to us five or six years ago. And so that's going to probably happen again five years from now. I, I don't have the answer. I don't think anyone has the answer. <coughs> we need to take calculated risk constantly. We're not going to get it right all the time. This is a reality. We're going to make mistakes. You just hope you, you get more things right than, uh, than you get wrong. So what is your uh, vision for your company and your vision personal for the next five years? Yeah. Um, I'll start with my company because usually that one's a little, a little easier. Um, you know, at, at Univision, when, when I got to Univision, we were the number one Spanish language uh, media company in the country, number one network in Spanish <coughs> here in the States. Today, Univision, uh, and this is, by the way, has done, accomplished a lot of great work, a lot of people, not me, but today, six and a half years later, Univision 
is still the number one network in Spanish, but more importantly, Univision today is one of the top five networks in this country, regardless of language, along with ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. So a lot of people look at me, they're like, oh, wow, that's cool, so you guys have as many Hispanics as ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We have as many eyeballs, we have as many people watching us. And they're like, oh, you can't be bigger than CNN. You know, we're like 10 times bigger than CNN. You can't be bigger than MTV. But we're like 18 times bigger than MTV. And so the fact that you know, our, our company, um, our network has been able to grow so much over that period of time, you know, my, my hope, my dream, our aspiration is that you know, it's not gonna happen next year, but five to 10 years from now, uh, if we continue to execute, um, and if we continue to have the growth that we think we're gonna see in the Latino community in this country, it is within a pretty decent realm of possibility that Univision could be the number one network in this country, regardless of language, English, Spanish, or otherwise. And so that for us is, is an aspiration. Uh, we gotta do a lot of things right between now and then. You know, and in my case, um, you know, I, I just got married about six months ago, so I'm very, very thank you. Thank you. So, you know, so for me, I, I, really what I'm looking forward to is, is uh, in the next five to ten years, hopefully I'm going to be a father, God willing, um, and be able to do some of the things that, that, that my parents did. And, you know, and, and professionally, you know, I, I hope we can, we can get to, to where we should get to as, as a company, and, you know, we'll see what the, what the next challenge brings. Thank you. Yeah. And some of the students have talked about how they try to talk to their peers but haven't been able to reach them. And so I was hoping you could talk about what is effective mentorship, maybe what you've done with your brothers, or how to be a good mentor. Yeah. Um, and you know what? It is, it's, it's, a, it's a good point um, that you bring up. You know, a lot of times people think of mentorship as only sort of upward or downward. And you know, I, obviously that's, that's an important type of mentorship, but I'll be honest with you, some of the best friends, some of the best lessons I've learned from are you know, which, the, the group you're alluding to, which is, which is your peers. Um, and you know, in some cases, it's, it's a little tough because you know, you're sort of in the same stage in life, and sometimes people have, have different values, they have different, um, different aspirations and different beliefs. You know, but, but again, I believe that uh, people follow authenticity, people follow, follow passion. And you know, what I always uh, encourage people is that as you're speaking, um, and this, this is in the specific case of your peers, um, I, I think you need to be able to try to connect with them on what are the things that, that matter to them. But a lot of people, you know, it's not, you know, they, they may not care about what they're gonna end up uh, in life, but when you connect it with the impact that it can have to their extended uh, family, per se, um, or to their parents or to their siblings. Um, I, I find a lot of people, you know, take a different perspective. Um, I know that uh, there's, there's an incredible story here in your class of, or you know, I'm sorry, I lost you. That you uh, you have three children. You're here from Boston. And it's, an, it's an incredible story. It's an incredible story. And you know, I, I would think that a lot of your inspiration was because of your kids and because of your children. And so, you know, I think if if you can tap into, you know, what are some of the values and some of the um, the uh, the morals that, that drive an individual. Sometimes it's not just about themselves. It may be about other things. So, my two cents. Thanks. Please. Um, you mentioned the program I said yeah. and I've seen it. It's very inspiring and motivational because it shows the experiences that other Latinos have gone through and how talented they are in their communities. Do you think the media should show more programs just like that in order to empower more Latinos and show them that we're out there and that we're making a difference? Yeah, uh, you know, the, short, the short answer to the question is, is yes. Uh, there's a few aspects to it. I think the first is, I think all media should be doing more of that. Not only Spanish language, but in many cases, I think English language media could also do a lot of good by highlighting the, the real successes of, of our community and, and many communities. The flip side of that is, you know, some media companies that are you know, very sensitive and cognizant to it, sometimes it's tough, right? Because they gotta run a business, and you know, sometimes people prefer to watch um, you know, what is it called, Jersey, uh, Jersey Shore, right? <laughs> then, um, then some of the stuff, you know, that we're talking about. And, you know, it's okay, we all have to be entertained too, we all wanna laugh and have a good time, but I think the key is uh, media companies, and companies in general, have to find that balance, or where, where they can deliver 
um, some of the things that, that, that people crave, but at the same time, they also have to nourish, nourish their souls in many ways. And so I think the trick is, is, is striking that balance. Uh, Jesse Jovell from yes. Middle Marymount University, Los Angeles. Uh, just a comment. The show at Google is one of my favorite shows of, since I could ever remember. I grew up watching the news. I thought it was amazing. I love that show. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you is, at 36, you've reached uh, a title that a lot of people are probably eyeing. How do you not become complacent, and where do you go from here? Yeah. Um, well, the, first of all, thank you for, for the comments on um, on our boom. But I'll tell you, this is a great example of, of another product that came out of my my year in DC. Um, you know, I, I've always been glued to watching Meet the Press growing up and all that sort of stuff. And I got to a new show, and we just we had done it, you know, maybe ten or fifteen years before, but we didn't have a show like that that um, that really allowed our our community to have influencers speak not about them but speak to them directly about the issues that matter on a weekly basis and i remember when we first got this show off the ground or trying to get the show off the ground people said are you kidding me you know latinos don't care about these issues they're not gonna they're not gonna watch this stuff you know and, and you're not gonna make any money right so put the second part aside you know, sometimes you just got to do things in life because they're right. But, but the first part, um, I will tell you, we're very proud. Al Punto today is the third biggest Sunday public affairs show behind Meet the Press uh, and ABC's uh, more, uh, Sunday show. So, you know, the reality it proves is, you know, it's not, I don't want to say if you build it, they will come, but it shows that our community cares uh, about issues that, that matter to them and they want to be spoken to directly. Uh, by people who are making the influential decisions of this country. And, and this is a little factoid. You know, when we started, we would get a lot of people calling us and saying, yeah, I'm going to send you my, um, I'm senator or whatever. I don't speak Spanish. I'm going to send you my Hispanic person or my assistant because they happen to speak Spanish. And we said, no, we don't, we don't want to hear from, you know, your, uh, your, your staff or whatever. When you get invited by me to the press, you go. And so we don't care that you don't speak Spanish. We'll translate. But the, the community wants to hear directly from you on the decisions that you're making. And you know, it took us two or three times to sort of break some heads and we hurt a few egos. But you know, after a while, now people know we've been on the air now about three years and change. Um, people know that we want, we want influencers. So anyway, just to give you a little context on that. Uh, you know, and as far as, um, as, as, as complacency, uh, I, I think that is one of the biggest um, challenges and one of the biggest threats that, that, that all of us have, right? And, you know, I remember when, when I got into college, you know, there, there was a few moments there where, you know, I'd look around and say, you know what, I got into a good school, I'm gonna be fine, you know, I, I don't need to do that well. And, you know, I, I'd have good friends and family, you know, sort of slap me around and say, hey, you know, that's, that's the worst attitude you can have. Um, you, can, you can literally, um, become irrelevant you, you you can all it takes uh in life is is a second where you take your eye off the ball and you know and, and you're just not going to maximize your potential and you all have been given too much I, I can tell it from reading your bio from from speaking with you a little um and from even you know, the opportunities that you've been given you all have been given too much uh to not maximize that not only for yourselves but but for your communities and so it's not only about you you owe it to people around you uh, to keep your to, to keep pushing yourself, and you know I, I, I wake up at every morning, um, and I think back to the programs that I, I had the opportunity to do like this, and you know these type of programs I think open up your eyes so that there's a lot of people who are incredibly smart, who care very deeply about this world, and and want to make a difference, and so when I wake up in the morning and I'm like. Ugh, you know, I, I don't really want to bring it today. I just want to kind of sit back and relax. You know, I, I remember some of the some of the folks I worked with in my year in DC, and some of the people I had some of the people I had a chance to go on different trips with and programs like this. And those people are amazing, and they bring it every single day. And so, anyways, it, it, it's just a matter of um, keeping the context that there's a lot of amazing people, and you know, you're you're just one of the people that needs to carry their own weight. To contribute. Thank you. Thanks. Let's take one last question. Yeah. Sure. Hi, my name is Andrea. 
What sort of techniques did you use to overcome the challenge of meeting people who were one, older than you, and two, more tenured than you? More te tenured than me. <laughs> um, and look, it's uh, it's a it's a fair question, and you know it's it's one of those things. Truth be told, I'm still I'm still working on it, and you know you refine it over a period of time. You know, I I, I think first is I'm I'm a big believer in, in meritocracies, and you know there's uh, there's organizations, there's governments, there's all, uh, all types of entities that are not necessarily about meritocracy, and, I, and I'm a real really, really big believer in that, and so I think. People are cognizant of that. You know, you look at you look at results. You know, you're very transparent about how you uh, promote people, um, how people are judged, and so I try to to really establish that. I try to establish that type of environment where I don't care about you know people's backgrounds. I don't care about what people have or haven't done. It's you know what are what are you contributing to the whole, and uh, and and how do you uh, how do you contribute? How do you contribute to the whole? I think second is um, is this issue I talked to you about, you know, uh, uh, authenticity. Um, I, I was fortunate in that I've worked at my company for a little while. I've been there for six years and change, and so people knew me. Um, they knew me in a different position, but they knew that I was very. Um, I believed very deeply in, in the work that I was doing, and that at the end of the day, I was I was trying to make sure that we as a group. Were, were growing and so it didn't have to be about hey I got credit or they got credit you know we as a group were getting credit and so I, I, I've continued to try to do that um, we we have incredibly talented people and you need to make sure that you highlight uh, the contributions that, that other people are making and very rarely do you have an organization where it's one person carrying the carrying law and that's certainly not the case with us and so I, I think that is a uh, that's a, that, that's an important thing, uh, and you know, and, and the only the third thing I'd mention is, you know, it's important that people understand that it's not a zero sum game, and so uh, it's not just about you know one position or one or one person. If you create an environment where there's opportunity and growth for for everyone, uh, I, I think that that uh, that resonates with people, and and people understand that you know just because so and so got into a role. There's so much for us to do, and there's so much opportunity for us to uh, capitalize on that. Uh, when people understand that, um, there's plenty to go around. So, great. So, so sorry, thank you so much.